Welcome and good evening. My name is Corinne DeBray, and I'm the Managing Director at The Foster. Thank you for coming, and I hope you've had a, a good opportunity to enjoy looking at art and um, having some tea and biscuits. So tonight's screening, it's my great pleasure um, that I'm announcing our guest artist explorer speaker, Megan Walla Murphy. Megan grew up spending time outdoors in the Santa Monica Mountains in Los Angeles County, and later on, um, it, her travels took her internationally to many countries and allowed her to spend time with indigenous people and learning how to track animals in Africa and other places. Tracker, educator, naturalist, connector, and collaborator, Megan is an amazingly multifaceted person who's grounded and naturally articulate, and yet she's integrating disciplines and educating people at the speed of light. Her journey has taken her from molecular and cellular developmental biology to a powerful blend of academic and environmental education, from the Himalayas to study overgrazing and work involving northern elephant seals to the plains of Africa, she also founded, happened to found a nonprofit and worked at the Topanga Mountain School and did a few other things in between. So it's amazing what she's been able to accomplish so far. Artists and explorers like Megan see and pursue things that many of us might miss. So it's our great pleasure to have her here tonight to help enlighten us things that we, she may have seen on these unseen paths that she's helping to integrate and communicate and educate us about. This evening, she'll share with us the art and science of animal tracking and a lot more about how to see things beautifully. It's with great appreciation. Please help me welcome tonight's speaker and give her a warm welcome and applause, Megan Walla Murphy. Well, I first want to just begin by saying thank you. There are a lot of things going on in the Bay Area and um, a lot of choices that we have to make and how we spend our time. And I just want to really extend my thanks and gratitude that you're here to learn about a kind of obscure out there skill set called tracking. And I also wanted to thank you know, the Foster and Corinne and the team of people who made it possible for this to happen. And uh, certainly we'll look at other things to give gratitude towards. So I just want to begin with this concept that all of you, somewhere in your ancestry, come from a lineage of trackers. And so I do believe in a little bit of reciprocity, so I'm just going to throw out a question. If I do, you can just shout it out. You don't need to raise hands. How do I know that you guys come from a, line, a lineage of trackers? We're all trackers. We're all trackers. What would have happened if you didn't? Yeah, exactly. Your lineage, your genetics wouldn't have been passed on. And through over two, oh, let's see, more than two decades of tracking, I have learned that tracking is kind of a paradigm that we see the universe through. It's not just simply following footsteps. And I want to offer that paradigm to you today. Like, go into your kitchen and track your kitchen. Go to your refrigerator and look at the door handle. You're going to be blown away. Go into, go into your living room and look at the couch. You know, and you'll see these tracks that are left everywhere. We track our own relationships, right? If you walked into a room ever, maybe when you were a kid and you knew your mom was angry before she said anything, that's tracking, right? So I want to open up that kind of a believability of what tracking is. And so, as Corinne had shared, I've been all over the world and tracked with a lot of different teachers, and one of the things that I've learned is you really give thanks to all of the different people who have contributed to your tracking skills. Um, and I'll just quickly go through this gentleman here is Dr. James Halfpenny. He's a carnivore biologist and was instrumental in the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone. Sue Morse, she's a forester and tracker in the Northeast and hunter. Alex and Renius are South Africans whose grandfathers, um, Renius is, was born in the Kruger National Park under a tree, and his family was pushed off by Alex's grandfather during apartheid. And they just randomly came together as guide and tracker um, in a Londolozi reserve, and they have now moved across the planet giving talks about tracking and how tracking unifies, and they're dear friends of mine. Um, in the center is Jack English. Maybe some of you know him. He actually homesteaded in the Santa Lucia Mountains in Pine Valley. He just died. He has probably, or well, he had known more about wildlife than I will ever 
be able to attain. He was one of the really deeply soul kind of John Muir people, and he was also a bow maker, um, like instrument bows, and so his bows are in orchestras, and he would make these bows in the middle. Um, and over here is a woman who, after being through apartheid, could still embrace people, and she taught me more about tracking culture and lineages than she did about animals, um, and I always am just thankful for her as well. And always to thank the water and the landscapes that bring us to where we are and how much I have learned about how they move. This is um, the most southern tip of Africa where the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans come together. And of course, the animals. They are tremendous teachers. And those things that are other than humans, I invite you to just see what they have to teach us. Um, and it, you know, I used to work with gang kids in Compton and Watts, and we would take them out into parks in Compton. And like, pigeons are nature, folks. Rats, they do cool things. Um, so I just encourage, you know, what is around us that we can learn from? So I like to start here because I also think um, of tracking as a study of home or ecology, eco coming from oikos, the Greek term meaning home and study of, and how we define home is up to you, right? It could be the earth is your home or your state, your individual house where you sleep. For me, Sonoma County is my home right now. I live in Occidental, about five miles um, inland from Bodega Bay, right on the crest of a mountain, in a banana belt in a really cold place. I was like, you guys have, it's like 25 degrees warmer here. It was really lovely. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I need to move here. <laughs> I came from Southern California. It's really warm down there. I'm like, this whole cold thing, I'm not sure. So let's talk about what tracking is. Um, like I said, it's a big, huge paradigm. But I think ultimately, it's about story and learning to read stories on a landscape and pattern literacy. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a story. So this is the Kalahari Desert. Um, after I had this kind of period in my life that was a country western song. I got divorced, I quit my job, we sold our house, my dog died, literally, like my dog died on the day that this all happened. Um, and I bought a truck and I drove around the country for about five or six years. Um, and I was going really deeply into my tracking practice at this time. It was like my late 20s, early 30s. And at that time, um, I had the opportunity to go study with Alex and Renius in South Africa, and I also had a car there, and I drove around the country, and I landed in the Kalahari, because I was curious to track with the Bushmen. Um, and what's so amazing is, you know those little guide books that you have? So there was this, oh, there's a guest house right outside the gates of the Kalahari Desert. Um, and there's a woman there named Anne Rasa. She is still there if you ever want to connect with her. And it turns out that she worked with Conrad Lorenz. Does anyone know who he is? Yeah. Yes, right? Um, and this is like truly in the middle of nowhere. Conrad Lorenz was um, a, Nobel P a Nobel Prize winner for science. He kind of coined etiology, which is the animal behavior study. So here's this woman in the middle of nowhere um, who had bought about 80 hectares of land there. And her whole point was to rehabilitate it. Because during apartheid, the Bushmen had been pushed off their land. Um, goats had been brought in and overgrazing happened and the dune grasses were dying and she had this land that she was rehabilitating to bring native species back. And what's really interesting about Anne was that when um, the Land Appropriation Act started to come in after apartheid where land could be reclaimed by people who had lost their land, the, the Bushmen had decided not to make a land claim act against Anne because she was doing such intrinsic things. But what was really incredible about Anne was that she had studied with someone named Fet Piet. And Fet in Afrikaans translates to fat, but Fet Piet was a very short Bushman that was really skinny. So I don't know why he got the name Fat. But so Fet Piet, I had heard of him. He was kind of this mythological being. He was one of the world's greatest trackers. And I bet Lisa, have you heard of him? Yeah. And I actually heard about him and really start to got to know him on the day that he died, or the day that we, this kind of tracking community I was in, um, he had died in a drunk driving accident, which is kind of the plight of a lot of indigenous people all around the world. But he had spent time training Anne how to track. And he would take her out, and they would go out on his land or her land, and he would look at tracks, and he would say, 
now, Anne, tell me what this track is. And so Anne did the same thing with me. And so we're out there, and we're tracking, and she's showing me these really obscure insect tracks. And I'm like, I have no idea what they are. And she's like, oh, those are Katie did tracks that are ovipositing, and it's a female. That, and I'm like, OK, great. I mean, like, literally, this is, and, and I'm a little bit, like, skeptical. And sure enough, we follow the track out, and there's the Katie did, like, doing this work. So Fet Pete would take Anne out um, and say, now, prof, because she was a professor, he'd say, now, prof, prof, tell me what this track is. And if she got it right, he would say, great, you did a wonderful job. If she got it wrong, he would say, no, no, you must cake moi. And so Anne's got me out on this landscape, and she's doing the exact same thing the way that she was trained, and I would miss something, and she'd say, no, no, you must cake moi. And I didn't know what that translated to, so she tried to kind of explain to me what it meant. And it basically breaks down into something akin to, you must look beautifully at something. You must see it for what it really is, rather than what you want it to be. Because um, I will attest, every single person I have met, including myself, you see a big dog track, and you want it to be a mountain lion. And your brain, like, you can make that track a mountain lion, I promise, you know? And, and I do it to my partner. Like, I can see him, and I'll be like, oh, this is what I want you to be. Um, but that's not really cake moy, right? I'm not looking beautifully at something, and it becomes really, really imperative um, that that is what you do when you are tracking, and that is what I do when I am in relationship with someone else. And when I'm working, I work with frackers in Colorado. I must really see those people if I'm to work beautifully with them. And so, you know, the day I learned this cake moy lesson, the next, uh, you know, the day, and then the next day I go out with this Bushman tracker, his name is Bok Peen, um, and I was out with a scientist named Gus Mills who studied cheetahs, and he was the first person um, pretty much anywhere, but certainly in South Africa, to use traditional tracking for scientific research. So this, I was so excited, and we just went out and we're looking for cheetah tracks. Um, but prior to my meeting with those folks, I got, to, this is the um, Kalahari, I'm butchering the name, sorry, um, National Frontier, Trans Frontiers Park, because it goes into Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. It's a three country international Kalahari Desert National Park. And so I got there a little bit early before I was meeting with Gus Mills, and I'm scouting around the buildings and I'm tracking all around, and I see this track here. And I'm like, and I pass it off, and I, and I say, oh, that's a feral cat track. And so if it's a feral cat, and maybe some of you understand the plight of feral cats in our ecosystem, they're devastating on, nat on native populations. And in South Africa, the feral cats are mating with the um, native wild cats, and they're losing this breed of wild cat that's really beautiful, and they devastate the bird population. So I see this, and I'm in the Kalahari, and I'm like, oh, the cats are everywhere in the middle of the desert. And then I literally, I hear Anne Rasa and Fet Pete in my head say, no, no, you must cake moi. And I look at this track, and I see, I'm like, oh, this is not a feral cat track, because this pad is huge. Um, and there's a little divot right here. And it turns out it was a genet track. And it changed the entire story of what was going on in that Kalahari ecosystem. Right? It wasn't a story about feral cats. They actually don't even have feral cats there. There is a beautiful wildcat present um, population there. And there's these healthy mesocarnivores that are there. And so this idea of cake moi, to look beautifully, is really what I believe tracking to be. And you don't have to be in the Kalahari to do it, right? Um, look beautifully at your refrigerator door handle. <laughs> and so why tracking? You know, like I said, it's really obscure, and yet, as I said, it has become the paradigm that I see everything through. Literally, after 20 plus years of tracking, um, my brain looks and thinks differently now. I have made synapses change, I think. I mean, I have no idea. I haven't tracked my brain. So the first thing is this idea of learning to hold a question. What does that mean to you folks, if anyone wants to shout that out loudly so the camera picks it up? Not so quick to have an answer. Yeah, and it's kind of the antithesis to what we were taught in school, right? We went to school, we're given a bunch of information, and then you take a test, and you're supposed to give an answer. It's uh, allowing the mystery to exist. Yes, al exactly. Allowing the mystery of something to exist. 
Um, and it's, it took me a lot to not feel insecure when I would come up on a track and have no idea what it was. So there's this element when you're holding a question to surrender to that mystery. You're basically surrendering to the unknown and surrendering to the fact that like, I don't have an answer and I might never have an answer. And it's been a tremendous gift to be able to say that. Um, but what's really miraculous for me personally about it is inevitably when I hold that question, the answer comes. And sometimes it's in a couple days, and sometimes it's in a couple years. Um, but I'll be in a conversation, and someone will be like, oh, look, I just took this crazy picture of a spider walking across the desert in the mud mating, and that will be the track that I saw a year ago that I had no idea what was going on. Um, and so there's this kind of beautiful like synchronicity that happens when you allow the mystery to exist. And it's been one of the greatest gifts that tracking has given to me. And then this idea of a break in the pattern, tracking breaks in the pattern. And the most kind of obvious place that we see that right now is we're seeing broken patterns in our climate. And so we have this kind of baseline understanding of what we thought happened, and there's big spikes of 500-year droughts and things, but our daily climate patterns are really changing from year to year, and there's a break in the pattern, and it alerts us to something that's going on. But let's check this out in tracking. So can you see that there's these like dots moving up the screen? Yeah, so those dots are coyote tracks. This is in the Adirondacks. Um, I was just telling someone, my family has a cabin in the Adirondacks, and in that country western spirit, I decided I was going to be like Thoreau on Walden Pond and move to the Adirondacks um, and live a hermit life, and turned out I'm not a hermit. But nonetheless, I was out there for a couple winters tracking. And I came on these coyote tracks walking down a road, and I decided to follow them. But this is a very regular pattern, right? That is a coyote trotting. And you will see that anywhere you go, whether you are on the beach in you know, Half Moon Bay or in the snows of Adirondacks or jackals. They trot the same way. You know, or probably dingo. I haven't been to Australia, but I would imagine dingoes move the same way too. So this is really regular pattern. So there's this pattern now. That trotting pattern has been broken. And you can see those four prints, that's what's called a box stop. So all of a sudden, this coyote that's in this really beautiful, light kind of trotting motion has stopped and put all four feet down. That's a break in the pattern. That makes me wonder, what is going on? Just as if we were in a conversation, and all of a sudden, you broke off the flow of the conversation. Like, did I offend you? I don't know. Um, so this, it's called a box stop. So then I was really curious. And I followed the tracks out more, and it trotted on. And then we came to this track. Does anyone want to take a guess at what this track might be? It looks a lot like a snowshoe rabbit, but it's actually the coyote sitting down. So those two are its front paws up there, and then you get the hind paws, and then those elbow long things that come down. I don't know what they're called in coyotes. And so the coyote was sitting, and it was looking off towards the creek, which is frozen over, and it's the wooded part of it. And I was like, wow. So now all of a sudden, another break in the pattern. The coyote stopped, trotted a little bit farther, sat down, and is looking in a very specific direction. So um, curious as to what it was looking at, I followed over in that direction, and I found this cache. Um, it was a deer that was cached into the ground, coyote tracks all around it. Um, and the coyotes had buried it, probably, and were uncovering it. And from what I could tell from this story was that there was um, a lot of activity and probably a pack of them that had been feeding off of it for several days. But the reason I was alerted to that was the break in the pattern. It changed the story. And for me, tracking is really metaphor, right? Um, a, think of the breaks and patterns in your own life. Like maybe there's a birth or a death or you've moved somewhere. Things get really rich with those breaks in the pattern, right? The story changes, transitions. And it's important to be aware of them. And so you need to know what the norm is. You need to know what the baseline is so that you can identify when things are changing. So I just like to throw that picture in because that's a good break in the pattern for you to think about. But you're going to hold the question, <laughs> surrender to the mystery. The other thing that tracking, I think, is so compelling is nothing has taught me that we are all connected. We hear it a lot in Buddhism, in a lot of the world religions, right? That there is this kind of deep connection between all things. And I think maybe intellectually I had heard it and 
believe, I was like, that seems pretty good philosophy, that's great. Um, but it wasn't until I really started tracking that I, I deeply understand this principle. And I'm still blown away by it. And I think I am just at the nascent stage of really understanding the implications of deep connection. Um, and I like this picture and story. Um, this is in Kruger National Park. This is the Olifants River. And I had, was able to, I was kind of up on this perch, able to watch this herd, a matriarchal herd of mothers and young um, come up to the river. And this herd had started what seemed to be random on that side of the river, and they were kind of just assorted. And then this is what's called an ancestral trail. An ancestral trail is when many, many generations of animals use the same trail over and over again. Uh, bears have ancestral trails, bison have ancestral trails, elephants, humans, right? All of our highways actually started as ancestral trails, right? So they've been crossing this river for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the elephants were random, and then they came into this water, and I watched all of the adults move upstream of the young and they were breaking the water force of the babies. Because you can see how deep that is, right? Those little ones are swimming, and you can even see the trunks are having to be elevated so they don't. And it was incredible. And so I, I really sat down, I was like, oh, the elephants are connected to the water and the current. They understand how that's moving. And not under, only are they connected to the water and the current, they're connected to their young and how that water and current affects each other. Um, and it was incredible. And then they crossed over in this very kind of Linny, you know, big ones up on upstream, the little ones downstream. And then as soon as they got to dry land, they went back into the, what I thought was a random assortment. It was remarkable to watch. And I just offer that that connection is not, um, that humans aren't excluded from that connection, right? That we have been a part of this communication and this language for a long time. Um, and we still are part of it if we allow ourselves to be part of the communication. Uh, when I was out actually at that Cape Point, I would go out and I would watch the sunrise over the Indian Ocean and then set in the Atlantic Ocean. And one morning it was kind of chilly and I was standing on these rocks um, and I was just waiting for the sun to rise. And I looked over to my left and there were these things called dossies or hyraxes. And there are these really, they look like rodents, but they're actually their nearest um, ancestor is elephants, but they're only about this big. And they were standing over there. And I looked to my right, and there's these South African southern penguins to my right. And I'm standing there like this, waiting for the sun. And they were doing the exact same thing. And again, that kind of idea of tracking and being in relationship, like there's some basic needs that we all have to survive. Um, and if we can break ourselves down into that, those basic needs, you know, Maslow's needs, I can't remember what the full term is. Um, it's, a, it's common, it's a commonality, even with the plants, like water, shelter, good soil, and nutrients. Perspective. This one has been really, really instrumental. I, like I said, I work in a lot of collaborations. I work with a lot of different kinds of folks. I live in Sonoma County. I work with ranchers and vineyards and um, diehard environmentalists and politicians. And being able to see multiple perspectives becomes really important in my work. And so um, this is in the Santa Lucia Mountains. I was actually hiking out from Jack, who is in that center picture, the bow maker. I was hiking out from his place. And um, it's a six mile hike. And in the middle of the trail is this really interesting track set. And when I come on a track, one of the very first things I do is I step back. Right? And I allow myself to see the whole vista of what's going on. Not just the tracks and the trail itself, but the landscape around it. How is that animal moving through the landscape? How is topography informing the animal? So I have this kind of big view picture, bird's eye picture, let's say. So in every one of those holes, as I got closer, there are actually two tracks in every one of those holes. And they weren't, right, they weren't superimposed or what we call a direct register. They were a little bit offset. Um, but that changes my perspective all of a sudden. I'm like, wow, it changes the story again. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess of what this is? Mountain Ooh, mountain lion's close. I, should, I have no size up here, but this is a bobcat. Great. So this is a bobcat, the front foot over, I guess that's to your right, um, and the hind foot to the left. And I was like, oh. So I get a little closer, and I start to see that there's actually 
claws right here. Um, and you rarely see claws in bobcat tracks, but that bobcat was digging in because the snow was icy and slippery, and it was really amazing. So as I got even closer, and all of this story starts to be revealed about these animals. Um, and then when I come on a track, I actually move all the way around the track because it looks differently from different perspectives. And I do that like when I'm in that place of I have no idea what I'm looking at track. This is what I do. I move all the way around the track and it helps to see things from different perspectives. I try and do that when I'm fighting with my sweetie and sometimes it works. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, no, this is my perspective. <laughs> but I try. <laughs> um, the other thing that for me that has come up is this kind of awareness of distraction. We live in an incredibly distracted culture right now, at least in um, the United States and certainly the Bay Area. I, I live in an amazingly progressive environmental community, and yet I would say they are all workaholics, including myself. We work a lot, we do a lot. Um, and I think that's okay. But what I've been learning through tracking is to be aware of when I'm distracted and aware of when I am not. Because when I am distracted and I'm tracking, I'm actually a danger to myself and to my animal plant community, right? I stumble through things, I tromp on things, I miss things. Um, and so I do choose sometimes to go home and watch like TV movies and allow that distraction to creep in. But I will say it is now a conscious choice and there is an awareness of when I'm distracted. And I really just encourage us like, oh, am I being distracted right now or am I really present with what's happening? It's a noisy culture out there. And then there's this idea of sense of place. And I think with, you know, without being teaching outside, this museum is possibly one of the most beautiful places to embody this idea of sense of place. I'm really astounded. I had done a little bit of research about Tony, Tony Foster before I arrived, and then um, I got this amazing tour this afternoon, and I was like, wow, what an incredible um, artist to go and to sit for days on days on end, and he tracks a landscape. And then we have these journeys of him tracking different landscapes day after day from different perspectives. And that idea of building a sense of place, of knowing where we are. We have a lot of disenfranchised folks right now um, for a myriad of reasons. And, and it broaden, it goes across in um, economic and ethnic groups, it, you know, it's not just one sect that's disconnected. And that idea of sense of place gives you an anchor and allows you to be home. So I grew up in Southern California and I didn't move to the Bay Area until 2012 and I landed myself in something called um, the Salmon Nation. We, right here, we live in Salmon Nation. And up in the Russian River, we still have Coho and Chinook and Steelhead. They're in De Coho, we're having a rough time, but they're still there and they're coming back. And I was so taken with these salmon and I started dreaming about them and they were arriving and like, people are like, oh, let's go see them. And one of them splashed and I was splashed with salmon water and I was like, oh, what is this? What's happening? Um, and what an incredible gift in like the cold, dark months, this source of fat comes to your neighborhood and dies. And you're like, wow, thank you, <laughs> right? Um, but it's a huge gift to live in Salmon Nation. And this idea of sense of place in returning to our native, natal tributaries. And it doesn't mean necessarily where you were born, but where are you natal to now? Can you return there? Can you tell me the scent of your home? And I don't care if you are you know, in the heart of San Francisco or you are in the Kalahari Desert, what is the baseline there? What are your patterns there? You know, where is your natal tributary? And tracking is my portal in. Music could be a portal, dance could be a portal, um, but I offer that tracking is one way to get into that. And so we're gonna talk about individual animals right now, if that's okay with y'all. All right, bears, I love bears. They're really good creatures, really neat. Um, and I will say that all across California, bear culture was ubiquitous. Um, until colonialization really happened, almost every tribe that I have worked with and known has a deep bear culture and relationship with bears. So um, I'm working on a black bear project right now in Sonoma County, and 
that um, an underpinning like theme and message that we're working on, and I'm working with state parks and fish and wildlife and all these folks, is how do we bring back the bear cultures, not just the bears? So there's bear track. We have our front that's on the right and the hind that's overstepping it a little bit. They have five toes like us. But everybody move your big toe right now. Just get really conscious of your big toe. And now put your big toe on the outside of your foot. Because that's where the bear's big toe is. It's on the outside of their foot, which is really neat. So up on our right, who are our players on, up on the top? I guess it's your left. Who's on the top left? Grizzlies. Yeah, so those are the grizzlies. California had the, especially coastal California, had the highest density of grizzly bears anywhere in the North American continent. And this is not a bear presentation, so I'm not going to go into it, but it's fascinating why. Um, and then here are our black bear friends who are still in California. There's probably over 30,000 black bears in California, and the population is rising. More than there ever have been. Um, and one of my beliefs is that because when we eradicated our grizzly bear, which we did an amazing job at, um, by 1922, I think, was the very last grizzly, and that was in Ventura, California. Um, we left a vacuum in which the black bears are now filling in. The orange spots are where grizzlies are today. The yellow is where grizzlies were, their historical range. So the bears really captured my heart, and the first time that I understood this just incredible reason why there was bear culture was when I found something called a step-by-step -step trail or an ancestral trail. Sometimes they're called traditional walking trails. And um, the first time I found it was in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts, and I had been taken to this place where what happens is the bears, they're walking, and as they walk, they actually pop their elbows and their knees, and they grind their feet into the ground to make the steps deeper than they would be if they just stepped on them. And so I'm having this all explained to me, and every place that there was a turn in this ancestral trail, the bears had clawed the trees. But what was really fascinating about this is, let's say this is point A, and th where the trail starts, and this is point B, where the trail ends. It was a really clear path from A to B, but this trail went like this, all the way around. They did not take the path of least resistance, which we often expect. They went this very circuitous route, and it was heavily, heavily marked, and had been that way, I mean, because you could tell how the scars on the trees had healed over decades. So, um, the people who are showing me think the trail was at least 100 years old. And so these bears, not only do they pop and deliberately mark these trails, they actually teach their young where these trails are and how to walk in them. And the other fascinating thing is if you're a big bear, you shorten your stride to walk in the same paths that the, the other bears did. And if you're a little bear, they have this on video, they extend their stride to walk in these same paths. I've heard and seen pictures of ones in Alaska that are like three feet deep, that they've just been used over and over again. And when you find one of these step-by-step -step trails, there's this kind of magic magnificence that comes over you. And it, it would be a little bit like walking into this museum if you were the only one, or if you walk into a cathedral and there's this quiet kind of presence. There's something there. And when you walk into these areas where there's these step-by-step -step trails, it's the same feeling. You're like, oh, something's going on here that I don't fully understand, but I can feel. No one really knows what they're about and why they do them. There's lots of thoughts of, oh, they're for reproduction, they're for food, they're scent marking, but no one knows why. And um, it's across the board, all across the northern hemisphere where black and brown bears live, they make these trails. And then they're just in relationship with trees. They mark the trees for feeding, they claw them. That's my friend Alex who was learning about the bears. He's no, there's no bears in Africa. So I'll give you guys a minute to read that. Can those of you in the back read it? Is it too small? OK, great. Do they scratch the trees so fungus will grow? Do they like You know, that's a great question. Are you thinking about Paul Stamets' work? Well, I don't know, because I think it was the fungus bearer. I want to oh. Say <laughs> yeah. Um, so they don't scratch it for fungus. Yeah. Um, they're scratching for scent marking often and for communication that's going on. Um, they also go up to the, and let's, 
like a bear will come up to a tree that's really craggy and you know you've seen those videos where they use it and you'll find hair snags part of it is for leaving um, scent and part of it is just because it feels really good and um, they do eat fungus but they're not scratching for fungus and then this um, kind of marking which are not really clear I didn't bring really clear scratches but what happens is those are marks of climbing. So they'll climb up into the aspens or the alders um, to eat buds, like to eat the buds that are up there. And they'll also climb up there to get um, like purple martin nests and things that are growing little in there. So the bears and the salmon are deeply intertwined and the bears are intertwined with our ecosystem and something called the anadromous nutrient cycle. So as these bears are coming back, um, they're, actually, they're instrumental in the health of our ecology. So this, I learned this maybe about 10 years ago and I was staggered. So in, if you were to follow um, some of the rivers all the way up into Idaho that empty into Washington, um, the salmon are traveling all the way up into Idaho. And when they started coring the trees in Idaho where the salmon no longer are able to get to, they started realizing that maybe like 10, even 20 years ago, that those trees held marine isotopes in them. And so what was happening is that the salmon were coming upstream, they were spawning, they were dying, the bears would go in, they would eat them, and then carry them away into the forest, or they would eat them, and then they would go and they would defecate into the forest, right? And creating all of this nutrients for the trees. Or they, there's such plentiful food, you can go and see this, it's incredible. There's such plentiful food that they'll just eat the heads because the head is where all the nutrients are in the brain, it's a lot of fat. And they'll leave you know, the entire fish with the exception of the head and then the eagle goes and carries it off and the coyotes come. And there's this incredible nutrient cycle that um, comes from the river that was actually carried from the ocean and nutrients, like ocean nutrients in Idaho. That's incredible. We don't know what happens now that we're losing our salmon runs, right? These are properties that we don't understand. Like what happens to those forests that no longer have their oceanic messengers? Um, it's a really interesting question and really important that we have the bears. And as I said, there's this deep, long bear culture. And I love this. Bears and Indians have lived together on this continent for thousands of years. Right? We kind of are a little bit afraid of bears now. And, oh, there's a bear in my neighborhood. And yeah, it's, it's exciting. I'm really excited. Um, but they've lived in relationship for years, even with grizzlies. Right? Montana lives with grizzlies. Both walk the same trails, fish the salmon streams, dug camas root from the same fields, and year after year harvested the same berries, seeds, and nuts. The relationship was one of mutual respect, but it went well beyond this. If you're interested in learning more about bear culture, this is a beautiful book, Giving Voice to Bear by David Rockwell. So the bears, I'll let, we could spend, I do a whole talk just on bears. We could spend a long time on the bear people. So the herbivores. You know, the more eyes you have, the more safety. Um, over and over, when I was in southern Africa, you see these two folks hanging out. Um, and often we think, oh, they're different species. Why would they be in the same area? They're both herbivores. Are they competing? Um, but they're actually not. They fill different niches in each other's ecosystems. So what do you think? So those are impala. And you see that little sweet black M on their rear ends. The trackers call them the McDonald's of the bush because everybody eats them and they're like pretty easy to kill. It shows you how ubiquitous McDonald's is. Um, so they, and can you tell just by looking at them like that their ears are their main sense, right? And they have these long noses. They have these incredible long noses and big ears. So they're perceiving the world through those senses. And yet you've got these baboons who are very similar to humans and have these binocular eyes and have this incredible depth perception to see predators coming. And they're amazing climbers and they're often in the tops of the trees. So they're relying on each other's senses to build a full relationship of what's going on. So the baboon gives an alert, an alarm, maybe for everybody, maybe just for their own troop, but everybody is listening. This is another triad that's also working off of each other's senses. The giraffes have the big height. Um, you've got the sense of smell with the wildebeest. The, 
zebra have the ears, and they're all working together. And so you get these mixed herds and mixed species. And I often think of like, how cool would it be if we were like, had all these mixed species in here right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just a dream. So the pit vipers. Pit vipers, um, is anyone, well, I'll just say. So here's a pit viper. This is a Mojave rattler. You should have a healthy respect for them. They are intense. I mean, that's incredible camouflage right there, right? And yet, I love them. And in fact, since I moved up to Occidental, where I live in um, the North Bay, I have yet to see a pit viper. I really, really miss the rattlesnakes. They're not on the coast, it's too cold, it's too wet, because they're such an awareness tool. They keep me on my toes. You know, I, it, it reminds me not to put my hands somewhere. And yet, I think they get a really bad rap. Everyone's like, oh, be afraid of them. But what if it was be aware of them instead? They become a, kind of like poison oak, right? Here's another one. This is a Kalahari, Kalahari horned viper. Again, that camouflage is incredible. And the thing that I really appreciate about these animals and these things that are perceived as being really dangerous is they tell us what's coming. You know, if you learn to read the signs and the tracking, um, you'll know, oh, wait, there's a, there's a sidewinder, there's one of these horned vipers coming, or I'm walking towards it, right? And so there are all of these lessons that are on the landscape that make these kind of scary, terrifying animals um, really relatable. And where you don't have to be terrified, you just have to be respectful. So the beavers, wolves, and elk. And I would, I would guess that some of you have seen that video about how wolves changed rivers. Yeah, so we're going to look at it a little bit because I was actually got to work with the wolves and, and the beaver and the elk um, when I was living with Dr. James Halfpenny up here. So beaver. There were at a time over 300 million beaver in um, North America. There's about 30 million now. They are rising. Um, but they are the reason that the United States, or what we now call the United States, was settled. Uh, the fur trappers came for beaver. Um, and in eradicating the beaver, we essentially dehydrated our landscape. Those are beaver tracks, if you ever come on them. Because the beaver create what, these ponds, and these ponds, um, water infiltrates into the earth and fills and refills our water tables. And when we lost the beaver, we lost these saturation ponds. And we saw that happening in Yellowstone. But we also saw the loss of the wolves. Just like the grizzlies, there was a long policy of um, predator eradication in the United States. And it's still in place in a lot of areas of the US. But all of the wolves were eradicated with the exception of um, the central Wisconsin and Michigan zones, Isle Royale. And then there's the elk. They're a really incredible player. Um, and wolves and elk, they really know how to live with each other. They've done a good job. There's this great book, and I'm forgetting the name of the author, a French author. Um, and it's actually a book about coyotes. But he says, this, it's the most beautiful quote. And he says, the shape of an elk's hip was designed by the jaw of a wolf. You know, and that there's this kind of um, continual dance and evolution with these two species. And the elk were preserved. Why were elk preserved? Who made sure that the elk weren't eradicated? The hunters. The hunters, right? And I will, and I have a hunting license, and I, I have no problem with really, um, and really respect a lot of hunters. But and the hunters have been incredible in a lot of our most important wildlife conservation laws. But they were protected. And when the wolves were eradicated, the elk population did something called eruption. Um, they erupted in population numbers because of something called the biology of fear. So when an animal is fearful and knows that there's a predator on the landscape, if you can imagine, it eats, and then it picks up its head, looks around, and moves. It eats, picks up its head, and moves, right? If you're not afraid of being hunted by whether it's a human or by a wolf, you sit, and you eat, and you eat, and you eat, and then you get big, and then you eat whatever it is, and you get this thing called Death by herbivory. Um, I love that term, death by herbivory. Watch out, vegetarians. <laughs> um, and here's an example. It's not a great picture. It's pretty granular. But there is a fence that's separating that aspen grove from this meadow. 
Um, and so the elk are not able to get into that aspen grove. And then over here, um, they have just mowed the entire thing down. And that's death by herbivory. This was an aspen grove at one time because there were no predators. This is a place in Colorado. Um, and I want to just add this little side note is that it's not just the wolves and predator. It's not only a top-down relationship. We have to remember that everybody is also responding to fire and disturbance and flood. So there's a lot, I don't want, I think what, what my bone to pick about that movie um, about how wolves change rivers is it's really simplified a very, very complex ecosystem that's out there. So I do just want to like um, love up fire and disturbance a little bit because they are also in relationship with the elks and the wolves as well. And especially, well, never mind. I'm not going to get into fire. So um, the wolves were still in Glacier National Park. And there was a belief that they would eventually make it down into Yellowstone. But people were impatient. And so in 1995, they were reintroduced. And they were invited home. And there's a wolf track. They're about the size of a small dinner plate. They're big. And that's an elk track that is um, moving quickly. There's a, the design on the right are the dew claws from that animal really pounding deeply into the soil. And so one day I was out tracking wolves, and I came on this track. And if you can see from where you are, there's three crescents going up the center of the photo. So those three crescents are the four feet of um, a wolf that's in something called a rotary gallop. And the first, this. Um, track right here is the front left coming down. The next time that that front left comes down is all the way at the beginning of that center um, crescent. And so I, because I'm a geek and I love it, um, I brought out my tape measure and from that first front left to coming down to that next front left, it was 17 feet. That's enormous, right? That's a 17 foot stride. And what that tells me is that this wolf was hauling ass. <laughs> right? And it was chasing something, most likely elk. And this is a dramatized re-storying. I didn't actually find this at the end of that trail. Um, <laughs> but what I was learning from Halfpenny was how to do necropsies on the elk. Um, because with the reintroduction of the wolves, the elk population plummeted. It actually it didn't plummet to the point of that um, an unnatural level, but it actually started to maintain um, a baseline of where it had been several hundred years ago. And what we were finding from these necropsies were that the the elk were only dying if they were old or diseased, right? That the the healthy, young, vigorous elk, the wolf could the wolves could not get them. They couldn't. They were too smart. They were too fast. Um, so it was really fascinating to see that. And so when you have this population that's actually stable of elk, the willow doesn't get hammered. The aspen don't get hammered. And the beaver then have food that they can eat because they are herbivores entirely. They don't eat fish. They only eat plants. And so with that, the willow started to come back. Um, and the beaver were able to come back and to really start to resaturate the landscape. It's really an incredible story. Um, and along with the disturbance and a lot of other things happening. So the last, I think this is the last thing that I wanted to really talk about were the gorillas. When I turned 40 a couple years ago, I was like, wow, what do I want to do? And one of the things that I had always wanted to do was to go and track gorillas. So I cashed in a considerable amount of my savings, and I went to the Congo to track the lowland gorillas. And I was mind blown. It was worth every penny, and I would do it again. Um, and I was way out there. It was, I've traveled a lot around this world, and this is one of by far the remotest places I have ever been, the Odzala Kukooa National Forest, which really is a national forest because somebody drew a line on a map and said, don't touch it. And I'm happy to share what this place is and know these families, because these families live as long as their own families. They live in villages with the gorillas. There are gorillas buried in human cemeteries. Um, it's fascinating. So I went, I had the privilege of being able to go out, and they're pygmy trackers, but I'm short, so they weren't that short, much shorter than me. Um, and we would go out, and I was astounded by 
how much they look like my uncle. <laughs> you know, really. I was like, wow. <laughs> but it, it changed it all, right? I was like, oh, we are deeply, deeply related. Right? And the, this expression, like, I've, been, I've seen that expression on my friends, like, wow, what is this? And why is it on me? And what am I doing? Or that curiosity, right? Like, who are you? And what's going on? Um, and that was one of the first things that blew me away. The other thing that blew me away about um, these incredible animals was how quiet they were. So if you've spent any time in a tropical place or even a big city where there's lots of life going on, it's really noisy, right? And you know, the Congolese rainforest was no different. The birds are going, the insects, there's water and rain and wind, and um, it's really cacophonous. And I feel like my perception or expectation of these gorillas was that they were going to make noise. You know, and we see these movies and we're like, ah, you know, that whole thing. And I will say, they do do that. They, but it's very quiet and very minimal, maybe if they're really upset, but we didn't really upset them. Um, and they were astoundingly quiet, and yet in some of the most incredible communication with each other that I've ever seen, like the communication was so clear and so directed. Like I watched the silverback just work with the families. I watched the mothers and the young talk to each other. They were like little toddlers, two-year-olds, that were no different than my friend's two-year-olds, right? Um, and yet the quiet and the solace that they had amongst themselves blew me away. And I really started to think, like, how do we cultivate that quiet within ourselves and yet still be connected and still have communication? Because I feel in this time when we are more connected through Wi-Fi and all of these things, we've lost the quiet. And so um, I just want to end with this picture, it's my dear friend Iratia, we were out in the Carrizo Plains, um, and just want to end with a question of like, how do you find quiet? Because I think it's one of the most important things that we can begin to model and gift to others. Like, how do I reach you in my own quiet? How do we still stay in communication and not have to speak all the time or act or do all the time? And I think this museum is an incredible offering and it can be through art or music or engineering or whatever it is, but I really um, would just love to, for you to ask that question to yourselves. I ask it every day, because it's not easy. And so thank you, you know, and um, you're welcome to reach out to me and send, people send me pictures of scat and tracks all the time, so uh, please reach out, thanks. <laughs>